I'd like to welcome everybody to our worship service this evening. Good to see everybody with us. Our uh, open hymn this evening will be page 191. Page 191, Home of the Soul. Page 191. After the song, that's for John who would the leader of mine. Page 191. If all the price we driven after our labors are o'er, the rest of our souls will be given on the eternal shore. One of the souls, a beautiful home, where we shall rest, never to go. Bring the whole air at the end bright. Jesus is there. Congregation prosper and grow. 
We thank you, Lord, for having Brother Boyd with us this week. We pray, Lord, that he may have a safe return home as he leaves us this, this party in this day. We thank you, Lord, for his ability. We pray, Lord, that he may have a long and continuous life in your service. We pray, Lord, that you would be with each and every one that needs your prayers that we may not be able to mention or think of their names at this time. But we know, Lord, that everybody that always needs you pray, Lord, that we may always be mindful. We pray, Lord, now that we be mindful of the things that we learned and taught and the things that we're responsible for. And we pray, Lord, that we'd always be good stewards of the things that you've entrusted to us. We may always live a life that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Give us, Lord, when we sin. We pray, Lord, that we may always strive to do better each day. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you will, please turn your hymn book to page 436. Page 436. Redeemed. Page 436. Sweet is the song.
enough to tell you this evening uh, what a treat you're in for. Brother Brooks Boyd has been with us and his wife Laura has been with us all week. And we are, I'm very sad that this, that this meeting, uh, this is our last night. And uh, so I want to encourage you, if you, uh, he has brought some very powerful gospel lessons to us this week. And if there's a lesson that you've heard that you think, hey, somebody needs to, somebody needs to hear that, tag them on Facebook, send them the YouTube link. Uh, just because the week is over doesn't mean that the truth uh, can't be taught and doesn't mean that the lessons don't have value after that. So uh, I'm very excited. Uh, when, when I looked at the topics, I, I don't know exactly what's, um, what he has coming to us, but the topic tonight is winter is coming. And so I know it's going to be a great one, so let's give our attention to Brother Boyd. Thank you for that, Audie. Just a few personal comments before I get started. It's been a delight to get to know Audie and Tori and Silas this week. Uh, he's a good guy, and I can kind of share your sadness as he's planning to be somewhere else in just a few weeks. A uh, good, sound man who stands up for what's right and cares about people. You can't ask for more than that. And certainly we wish you well, brother, in your endeavors to improve your service uh, in all that you do. And we'll be thinking about you. Uh, we appreciate the good meal tonight. That was a joint venture of the uh, Montgomery's and the Grissom's. Had uh, excellent food. I uh, told somebody a while ago, uh, it's primarily about the fellowship. That's why we do this. It's not because we're really bad hungry and we're trying to find the best food in town. Uh, it's because we enjoy being together. But the comment was made, uh, the fellowship seems to be a little better when the food's good. And so we had good food tonight and good fellowship. But one more thing, maybe more than that, but it does my heart good it's sad for us to leave anytime we come and visit with you folks for whatever reason, whether it's to preach or to deer hunt, whatever it is. Uh, it, it just hurts a bit when we pull away. Um, but it's really a delight as I look back over several years to see the people who were kids <laughs> when I first came here for the first time now bringing their kids, if you don't mind me calling them kids, uh, and training them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Keep that up. That is a great thing to see. It does, old folks like me, a lot of good to see that progression of faith as you continue serving the Lord. And that's one way to grow the kingdom, you know, is to raise up children who are Christian. So keep up that good work. I appreciate you. Thanks to all of you. We've got visitors tonight. I appreciate you so much. Turn your Bibles now, if you would, with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Back home, my secretary asked me to put my sermon text with my sermon title. And I don't always like to do that because sometimes that gives it away. I, I don't want everybody to know what to expect when they see the sermon title and say, uh, we've heard that before, or I know what he's going to say. I, I want people to kind of be intrigued by the title. Uh, like Audie was saying, he's not sure what I'm going to do with it. Uh, it. It really doesn't matter uh, because when I put the sermon text with it, I still have a brother that uh, says, your brain doesn't work like mine. <laughs> and and I know you're probably right about that, and it's not because mine's better. Second <laughs> uh, Timothy chapter 4 uh, is the last thing, as far as we know, that things have changed in the world since he first began preaching. Uh, he has been persecuted by Jews, but now evidently the Roman Empire is after him, and uh, they now have him as one who is going to be a sacrifice to appease the Jews, perhaps, for whatever reason, he knows he's going to die. Here you have the 
last thoughts we would say of a dying man. And in verse 22, as he's writing these thoughts to a young gospel preacher, Timothy, uh, verse 21 rather, he says, Do thy diligence to come before winter. Winter's coming. You may not know much about Houston, Texas. I didn't know a lot about it until Laura's sister moved there. In 2021, we went to visit them right after, the week after, a severe cold front had come through. It actually snowed. Houston, Texas is on the coast, the Gulf of Mexico. You would think that'd be a little bit of a warmer place to be. It snowed in Houston. They had a severe freeze uh, along with the snow that occurred in Houston, Texas in February 2021. People had pipes that burst because down there, you think, it's a warmer climate. We can run our water lines from the hot water tank over to where it needs to go in the attic. Well, when you have PVC pipes in the attic and the temperature gets down in the teens, why then you're going to have most likely a problem with that. And in fact, your whole house may get wet. And that's what was happening to many in Houston, Texas in February 2021. A surprisingly cold winter in 2021, 1993. We were living in Gadsden, Alabama. We had 25 inches of snow in Gadsden, Alabama in 24 hours. We had what somebody called a category one hurricane with snow come through our part of the world. And we had all kinds of tragedy as a result of that. Winters can be tough. The time to think about what we would do in a tough winter is not when that tough winter gets you. It's in the months before. And so when Paul tells Timothy, do your diligence to come before winter, Paul is suggesting, you know, in our part of the world, he's in Rome, in our part of the world, it's very possible that travel gets shut down, especially if you're talking about traveling across the Mediterranean. Travel's going to get shut down, that is, international travel. You're not going to be able to go freely where you want to go if you wait until winter. So get here before winter so that you can make that journey without any hindrances. Go back with me to verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 4. He first says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed to Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books but especially the parchments. We're going to see some more in this, but notice these first thoughts here. The Apostle Paul says, I want you to come to see me as quickly as you can because I need that coat. That coat must have been something that he put a lot of stock in, a lot of money in perhaps to purchase, or else it was a gift from someone special that he cherished. But either way, it was something that he needed because cold weather's coming. The prediction for this Sunday here, I heard on the radio here in uh, Madisonville, Dixon area, is 99. Uh, with a heat index of 107, they say. I've, I've always wondered about that. Now, I can understand when you don't have enough clothes on, you go outside in the cold, and, and you have uh, that wind chill factor. That's a valid thing. That actually occurs. But the heat index, if it's hot, it's hot. And, and don't tell me it's hotter than it really is. If it's hot, you can tell. If it's 99, what does 8 degrees make difference does that make? You know what? I, I don't get that 8 degree thing there. Uh, if it's hot, it's hot, uh, and you're going to break out in a sweat. It's going to be hot here for the next few days. It's probably going to be hot here for the next few weeks. But when? When the calendar changes, when the sun begins to go farther south, uh, when God says it's time to go back to the cold seasons. Incidentally, 
The other day, I was doing something that I rarely do. I was shopping with my wife. I don't enjoy that a whole lot. I do every now and then because I know it makes her happy. And one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is, is husbands loving their wives according to knowledge. And so I, I, I like to make her happy every once in a while. But she's off looking at something else. I'm looking at bargains and the stuff that might have something to do with men. And, and I run into one of uh, the members of the church in that part of the country. And uh, we were talking about buying Bibles. And there's an older woman that she's kind of milling around these bargain bins, but she keeps looking up at me and she's milling around and she looks at me. And, and after this lady that I was talking to leaves, she comes over and she said, sir, can you tell me where in the Bible it talks about the seasons changing? And I said, yes, ma'am, I can. Genesis chapter 8, the last verse tells us that God said, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, shall not cease, or seed time and harvest, shall not cease from off the face of the earth. And she said, thank you so much for that. Me and a friend of mine were talking on the phone today, and I told her, I knew that was in the Bible somewhere, that God said the seasons will change. And I said, well, I'm, I'm glad that I could be helpful. Why did you ask me that? She said, well, I heard you talking, and I knew you had to be a preacher. Right? And so I thought I could ask you that question. Uh, uh, it was... Something that I have talked about before, though. Because of all the things that people are saying about we're doomed, uh, every, every few weeks you get a new message about how bad things are concerning the climate. We're doomed, and we are going to be drowning here in the melting polar ice cap before long up here in Kentucky or wherever you are. The uh, water's just going to cover the earth because of global warming. God said no. <laughs> That's not going to happen. It may get hotter for a while. It may get colder for a while. But cold and heat, summer, winter, seed time and harvest shall not cease from off the, off the face of the earth. Winter is coming unless the Lord comes first. We can have that in writing from the Word of God. When we think about winter coming, Paul is asking for his cloak and his parchments and his books. We would ask tonight, are there provisions that need to be made before winter gets here? Well, sure. My grandpa, at age 90, was asked by his daughter-in-law, my mother, who had not seen him in several months, what do you say, Pop? And he said, save your money. Putting away some provisions for the winter is not a bad idea, is it? Saving up some money for the future. Not a bad idea. We call it saving for a rainy day. Well, the word winter here in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 21 actually means the rainy season. But in that part of the world, the rainy season was the cold season, the winter time of year. Proverbs chapter 6. Solomon said, if you're lazy, a sluggard, he said, go to the ant, thou sluggard. And consider her ways and be wise. What does an ant do that I can learn from? Well, if you get in their way, you'll find out. Uh, they're going to try to get you out of their way. We have ants in our part of the world I've never seen before. They make mounds like fire ants, but they're not fire ants. They're bigger. And they don't sting you like fire ants do. They bite you. <laughs> they want you out of their way because they're going to be dragging something at least as big as they are, if not larger, into their little mounds for the winter time, so that they can eat on it later. Solomon's keying in on that with these ants. They prepare their meat in the summer, but it's not their summer meat they're preparing. It's what they're going to eat later on. They're working all the time, getting ready for what's ahead. They're planning uh, they are saving, we would say, for the future. There's some natural warning signs. If you look around, now I, I grew up in a country environment, not in the country, but in a country environment. Um, if you notice, sycamore trees are already starting to lose some of their leaves. There's a few little warning signs that tell us it's hot right now, but it's not always going to be hot. That's going to change. 
squirrels. This is something that I grew up knowing something about. Squirrels are cutting pecan, or excuse me, they're cutting pine cones right now. They're getting the seeds out of those pine cones. You will see at the base of a pine tree all this shredded up material from a pine cone. That's a squirrel. He's eating the nuts out of that pine cone. Well, that's a sign that cold weather is coming. That's the way I see it. That's going to change. Heat's going to change into cold. The slothful, well, not everybody that's wasteful is slothful. Some people just don't think about needing to store up for the future. Luke 15, we're talking about that young man who said, give me my inheritance, give me my portion of the inheritance. And he took it, and instead of investing it and growing it and making for himself a nice nest egg, he went and blew it on scrambled eggs. Uh, one little boy said when the preacher was talking about uh, the prodigal son who wasted his sustenance on righteous living, he said that means he spent it all on bubble gum. Well, something like that. He wasted it. He was wasteful. Well, there are some practical lessons about life you learn from Proverbs, but my thought tonight is not just about practical things. All of If you're an employer or an employee, from Colossians chapter 3, verses 22, through Colossians chapter 4, verse 1, Christians ought to be the best, most productive employees and the best employers because in both cases, we are serving the Lord. Whether I own the business or I pay people who run it for me, we're all working for the Lord. We are all trying to please him in what we do. And so there in Colossians chapter 3, 21, on down to the end of the chapter, we're talking about servants, employees, who are to be serving as if they were working for serving the Lord Christ. And the Masters chapter 4, verse 1, you need to be paying your uh, employees what is just and equal because you, he said, serve the Lord Christ. We've got some principles about work here in the New Testament. But there's something that we need to add as we think about these provisions. In, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28, I love this passage because we used to take communion to a young man who used to be a murderer. Uh, he's in prison. We're taking him communion, having a worship service. In fact, we would take ours and take it with him there uh, in the prison setting. And uh, Ephesians 4, 28 always come to mind, would come to mind when we would go see this young man named Dallas. Ephesians 4, 28, rather, it, it says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Why are you working? Well, I'm working to provide for myself and my family. That's right. But... The Holy Spirit says you need to be thinking about what else you do with that. It's not just you. Think about those folks that don't have, that can't, that aren't able to provide. You give to him that needs it. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, implies that that's doing something more than just taking care of somebody's needs. He said, lay not up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust and corrupt and thieves do break through and steal, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust of corrupt, and thieves do not break through the steel, for where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. In Luke's account of that, he's telling rich Pharisees, if you will start giving to the needy, you're going to get your heart right. You're going to be laying up treasure in heaven. And that's not the only way to do that. Somebody says, what does it really mean to lay up treasure in heaven? Are we going to have a big pile of money up there in heaven when we get there that's got our name on it? Here's your treasure in heaven. When our men leave prayer for the giving, for the contribution, what is it they, they very often say about what we're going to do with what's being given? Help us to give cheerfully, help us to give bountifully, that the work of the Lord may continue, right? Is that what we say? Work of the Lord, Luke 19, 10, is the saving of souls, the seeking and saving of the lost. That's one of the main things we do with the contribution. 
We've got to edify. We've got to keep the building. We've, we've got to take care of the needs of, of our fellowship and, and the edification of the congregation. We've got to save souls, and then we've got to stabilize the churches as a result of that. But I'm going to suggest to you one of the things that will be part of our treasure in heaven will be souls. That in some way I'm responsible for influencing whether it's because I gave and the missionary that we sent out to teach the lost taught that person. And my money had something to do with that. The money that I gave to the Lord, it's his money always, but what I gave had something to do with it. Treasure in heaven. Revelation chapter 3. Think about this. Jesus is the one who is uh, he's dictating these letters to the angels of the churches where they're going. And, and to, the, to the church of Laodicea. He says there in verse 17. He said, Thou sayest, the church is saying this in mass, in, in, in the collective we would say, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. That's a big church right there. We, we don't have any need for ever borrowing money again. We've got the biggest bank account. We've got promise of it staying a big bank account because we've got the best attendance of any church in the country, and we're doing great. The numbers prove it. And Jesus said, And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me those garments that last, those, those eternal garments, those, those robes that you can put on that don't decay. The moths, and the, and moths don't get to them. And, and the treasure that I could give you, the eye sand that I could give you and heal your eyes so you could see what you really are spiritually and what you need spiritually. Jesus said, need to fix your eye problem. Because you don't realize, even though you've got a lot of money, you're not rich toward God. We've heard that somewhere before, haven't we? In Luke chapter 12. Not rich toward God. Here's a church and they're not rich toward God. Imagine that. Is there something about provisions that we need to take care of before winter. Are we putting our money where we ought to be putting our money? Are we giving to the Lord like we ought to be giving to the Lord? Are there provisions that are needed? Winter's coming. Number two. Notice he says here in uh, verse 10, speaks of Demas having forsaken him. Other fellows that were still part of his work, still connected to him, but they weren't with him. Luke was the only one that stayed with him. Luke, the author of the book of Acts. His traveling companion later on in life. He's with him. Take Mark and bring him with thee. Verse 11. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. You remember Mark? John Mark. He's the one in Acts chapter 15 that the apostle Paul said, he's not going back with us. When Barnabas wanted to take John Mark on this next phase of their mission work, Paul said, that's not good. Because back in Acts chapter 13, when he saw there was going to be some real conflict between the people of the world and the work of the Lord, he turned tail and went home. He's unreliable. I'm not going to take him back on another mission trip. He'll do the same thing, most likely. You know, future expectations are based upon past performance. And so, no. Something in between Acts 15 and 2 Timothy 4 had changed. Barnabas saw perhaps what Paul couldn't see personally. Or it just could be the case that because Barnabas took it, John Mark grew spiritually like he needed to. He developed the backbone, evidently. Well, no doubt about it, because he wrote one of the gospel records, right? And Paul said, he is profitable for me. Are there personal relationships that need attention? 
Maybe there's something Paul wanted to say to John Mark that he hadn't gotten to say before this time. And I want to tell him just how much he means to me face to face. Like John said in, in 2 John and in 3 John, he gets to that last verse and he says, I've got more to say to you, but I don't want to put it to pen and ink. I want to say it to you. Are there personal relationships that need mending? Imagine if you were Euodius and Syntyche, Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. How embarrassing would that be that your names for all eternity are in God's Word, the only negative thing really in the book of Philippians, and it's your two sisters that can't get along. Uh, encourage them. Uh, you, you exhort them that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Tell them to settle that and quit causing problems in the church, in other words. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, 24. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. If you are the offender or you are the offending, either way, you have a responsibility in that situation as a Christian to resolve a problem situation between you and your brother. If you come to the altar and remember, you come to worship, and I remember my brother has all against me. Now, practically speaking today, if you wait until Sunday morning, you're on the way to Bible class and think, I've got a brother that's got a problem with me. I'm going to turn around and go to his house. You probably should have thought about it before that. Now, how about thinking, I, I'm going to go on to worship in hopes that he'll be there and we'll solve that so that our worship can be acceptable to God. But he said, you first be reconciled to your brother, then you offer your gift. Matthew 18, if your brother has, all, if you remember that uh, you have all against the brother, you've got an unsettled issue. Here's somebody that sinned, and it is something that affected you, and you have personal knowledge of it. Take a stand. Do your best to resolve it. You can't make everybody do right. He acknowledges that in that passage. But he says, make an effort to repair that relationship. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, he says, stop picking at each other. In essence, judge not that you be not judged. What judgment you judge, you shall be judged. Does my relationship with somebody else affect my relationship with God? No doubt about it. He says it right there. If I really have a pick against somebody, it's just a personal thing. I just don't like something about them. And I'm going to say, you know, They've got this habit of saying or doing something and it just really irritates me. I'm not having any more to do with them. God's going to look at me and say, you know, you've got to have it almost exactly like that. I'm not going to have anything to do with you for eternity. That's not a good place to be. Judge not that you be not judged. And what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. What measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. God's going to do that measuring part, that last part. Matthew 7, verse 12. Well, before that, in Matthew chapter 6, in the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples to pray, it's not the Lord's prayer, it's the one he taught his disciples to pray because of this very thing. There in verse 12, he says, this is what you say in your prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus never had a debt that he owed to God. He never had a sin, a transgression, a trespass against God, Hebrews 4, verse 15. But he's teaching his disciples, you are going to. You know you're going to. So when you pray, you ask God, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And he explained in verses uh, 14 and 15, we're talking about trespasses here. Uh, for uh, whosoever will forgive a man his trespass, God will forgive him. But whosoever forgiveth not his brother trespass, neither will God forgive you your trespasses. That's sin. Does my relationship with someone else affect my relationship with God? Certainly. Husbands? I could talk to wives too. I think the principle goes both ways. But it's stated for the husband in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Likewise, you husbands, Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, 
being heirs together of the grace of life. Now watch the last part of that verse. That your prayers be not hindered. A man who mistreats his wife is abusive, unkind to his wife. God has an opinion about that man. God's opinion of that man is, you've just cut yourself off from talking to me until you fix that, until you change that. The road between here and heaven is dug up, is what that hindered means. And the husbands, you cherish, nourish that woman like Jesus nourishes and cherishes the church. The Ephesians chapter 5 tells us. Wives, you love your husbands. Titus 2, 4 and 5. Now you be good to your husbands as well. James chapter 2, verse 13. He shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. I want to be in the mercy column, won't you? God's mercy. I need to be a merciful person. I don't overlook or ignore sin, but I don't have unrealistic expectations of people, especially of brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's one more, then we're going to move on to the last thought. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Jesus said, well, he said something that a young woman remembered. Young woman was dating a young man. She really liked him. She really, uh, he really liked her. But he did everything by the book. He was very careful in his relationship with this young woman. He had dated her for over a year. He would drive her home. He would get out and open her door and walk her to the front door. He would take her hand and say, I've had a wonderful evening. I really like you. And I hope that we can go out again. But he never could find the passage that would allow him to kiss her. He just couldn't figure that out. He didn't get it. He just... It, he knew Romans 16, 16, but it was a holy kiss, and, and it, it's more than that for him, not just a, a, a friendly, a brotherly, sisterly kiss. He wants her to know that he wants to marry her. He wants this woman to be his for the rest of his life, but he couldn't find the passage, and so he's about to walk back to his car. She jumps uh, off of that step uh, going into her house, grabs him around the neck, turns him around and kisses him. And he said, where's your passage? Where's your passage? She said, Matthew 7, 12. Whatsoever you would that man should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. <laughs> I hope you'll remember that. But now remember the last part of the passage too. Whatsoever you would that man should do unto you, do ye even to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Jesus is living under the old covenant and he said this statement, this principle, whatever you want done to you, you treat others that way. This is the law and the prophets. What does that mean? I understand that to mean this is how you apply, you boil down and you summarize the personal application of all that's taught in the law and the prophets by being kind to those around me, to treat my fellow man the way I want to be treated. This is the law of the prophets. Well, that's not all that God taught, but isn't it the second commandment? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew 22, Jesus said in verses 37 through 39. We need to appreciate there may be some personal relationships that need attention, but finally, Our spiritual concerns the priority. We left off talking about Demas. He had forsaken Paul, verse 10. Pick up with verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. And my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work 
and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus, Erastus of old at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletus sick. Do thy dil diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. Timothy, you be sure to guard your spirit. Because spiritual things are the priority. You, you, verse 22, you have the Lord Jesus with your spirit. You make sure he's with you. Spiritual concerns need to be the priority because winter is coming. We know why Paul wanted the coat. It's going to be cold. Why did he want the books? He's about to die. The, the books, we, we think most likely those are Old Testament books, copies of those, the parchments, more recent writings, no doubt, uh, books that were part of the New Testament as it was developing at this time. Maybe some of the copies of what he had written. But nonetheless, you bring the books and the parchments, especially the parchments. Because you see, the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 3, 3 through 5, has, has told me and the, the holy apostles and prophets that have written these things what to say. This is from God. This is God's book. Paul wanted the book so he could study. You see, he was getting ready for his final examination. He was getting ready for the final test. He needed to get just a little closer to the heart of God. You can't do that apart from God's Word. I can't do that apart from God's Word. Perfection ought to be our goal. Now, let me explain that. We had a young man, Fried Hardeman, when I was there. I'll not tell you his name because he might still be alive within this part of the country, and I don't want you to think badly of him. But he actually believed that you as a Christian had to live a sinlessly perfect life every day. And that if you sinned, your hope of heaven was terminated. That young man was the most unpleasant, negative-minded fellow I've ever met in my life on a personal level. You try to spend time with him. He didn't want to spend time with you because I, I suppose he had developed something of a monastery mindset where I've got to stay away from people so I won't be tempted to sin. I might say something, somebody makes me mad, and I'll sin if I do that. Perfection doesn't mean sinless perfection, but look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. The Apostle Paul has just talked about Christ being in us. Verse 27. The hope of the world which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And now in verse 28, he's going to tell us why he's been preaching. Whom we preach, notice, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man, what? Perfect. In Christ Jesus. Perfect in Christ. He goes on in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 to say, your perfection is in Christ. That means completeness. I am spiritually complete in Him. I get that. Paul says the way to cause that to happen with someone else is for you, Timothy, to help them. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, you, son... You need to be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you need, verse 2, to remember what I've taught you, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And by the way, Timothy, verse 15, you give your diligence, you study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Spiritual things must be the priority. Chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Timothy, you remember, you've known the Holy Scriptures from your childhood, from your youth. You've been studying the Bible from the time you were a young man. Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means that's good for you. It will complete you spiritually. It will make you what you need to be. But now he breaks it down there. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, 
Throughly furnished, the King James says, and that's not a bad record. Through and through is the idea. Throughly furnished unto every good work. I've got to give myself to spiritual concerns. I've got to make it my ambition to be complete in Christ. Now Paul said he wasn't. Philippians chapter 3 verse 13, he said, I count not myself to have apprehended. Can you think of anything the Apostle Paul failed to do that he said his mind on doing? I, I don't know it. In the service of Christ, I don't see him failing at any term, but he said, I count not myself to have apprehended. I haven't got a lock on this thing yet. But this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forth to the things that are before, I press on to the mark of the high calling, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Moving on, pressing on, growing spiritually. Paul's an example of that. We can take that example and we can learn from it. Winter's coming. The time's going to come when your hearing's not going to be as good as it is now if things go according to nature. I can verify Chainsaws and hunting rifles and shotguns, <laughs> they have affected my hearing. I have hearing aids, I just don't like to wear them. <laughs> Your hearing is not going to be able to pick up on the things you can pick up on right now. Someday, it's going to start to diminish. And all the rest of us is going to wear out. Psalm 39, verses 4 and 5 says, Lord, make me to know mine end what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Verse 5, he said, Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbrick. I was trying to look it up today. What, what do people think the difference in a handbrick and a span is? Well, that's it. That's a span. That's a handbrick. But I'm, I'm sure mine's either down to that or that. <laughs> okay. My hand breath is falling off quite, quite a bit, quite rapidly. Uh, I'm advancing in years. I hope to see your children's children bringing their children to worship someday, but I might not live that long. Days are just a hand breath. And my age is nothing to thee. Verily, man. At his best estate is but vanity. I'm nothing in the, in the presence of the eternal one. My life's nothing. It's a vapor. James 4, verses 13 and 14. Winter is coming. It's time to make provisions for eternity. It's time now to... Patch up those personal relationships that need our attention if we are able to do anything about it. And I'm just persuaded, try one more time and it might make a difference. There are some spiritual concerns that we need to move up the ladder and get them as priority. My own personal spiritual growth, my own commitment to Christ where I make a commitment that says, I was baptized for a reason, Romans 6, 3, and 4. I'm not going back into sin. I was baptized for a reason, Romans 6, uh, 5, and following. I am going to live for Christ from now on. Every decision I make is going to be based on what would Christ think about what I'm doing. I want to serve him and please him. And there are some, Jude, verse 23, is it? That I know. Having compassion, verse 22, can make a difference on those people, but now, on some, I snatched him out of the fire, hating even the garment that's spotted by Satan. What did you mean when he said, you, you pulled them, you snatched them out of the fire, the American Standard Version says. Uh, they're not long for this world. They are in sin, and they're my brothers, they're my sisters, and I know they're in sin. I know they're not putting Christ first. I know that they are doing harm to the body of Christ by their example and influence. And I'm going to do everything I can. This is emergency effort. I need to go and get them now, rescue them to the best of my ability. I'm going to warn them. I'm going to plead with them. I'm going to beg with them to get them back to the Lord. 
I can't make it happen, but maybe some of the things that I do, James 5, 19 and 20, will convert that sinner from the air of their way and cause their soul to be saved. I won't know until I try, but now is the day of salvation. Now is the day that I need to make preparation because winter is coming, spiritually speaking. The end of my opportunities is coming someday. Are you a child of God? You only become a child of God by doing what the Apostle Paul said you do to become a child of God. Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And now that's not the whole category. That's the broader category. He's going to narrow it down in the next verse. He's going to explain who among those believers is a child of God. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ did put on Christ. That's how I get into Christ. If you're not in him tonight, as a believer, John 3, 16, you must repent of your sin. That means stop sinning on purpose. I need to get out of those situations, relationship, whatever it is that's causing me to be a sinner, to sin against God, Luke 13, 3. I need to confess my faith in Christ, Matthew 10, 32. Be buried with Christ in baptism. We mentioned Romans 6, 3 and 4. That's where the Bible says that. So that my sins can be washed away, Acts 22, 16. And I need to live for Christ from this day forward, 1 John 1, verse 7, walking in his life. And if I haven't done that, if you haven't done that, I'm pleading with you tonight. Make whatever sacrifice is needed to serve Jesus Christ right now from this day until winter comes. And then you'll have a home in heaven. If you're a strange child of God, come home tonight. Don't put it off. Don't waste another hour, another minute, another day for sure. Thinking you're going to someday. Winter's coming. Don't know when. Are you ready? If you're not coming as a child of God, confess your sins and let's pray together. And God will heal our relationship. God will heal our relationship to Him. Will you come right now while we stand and sing to the church?
you so much for letting us be here and be a part of this week. Thank you. There are many of you that haven't missed a single session, uh, a single service. Keep up the good work. Uh, those of you who have other things, we understand most of the time, but, but keep on keeping on, doing the best you can with what you have. We're going to miss you terribly, and we're going to think of you often. Pray for us. Thank you. If there's nothing further, our closing hymn will be page 642. Page 642, where he leads, I'll follow. After this song, ask for a minute if you would to lead our minds in prayer. Page 642. <clears throat> we are the promises right.